Hello, Facebook. Tommy Valentine. Um, we are so glad that you're tuned in today with us for our one o'clock episode of This Moment in History, COVID-19 in Athens, Georgia. Um, as you probably know by now, this is uh, every weekday at one o'clock, we take this opportunity to document and explore uh, this moment, this unique historical moment um, in our community and our nation's history. We do that by having a discussion with a cross section of community leaders, business owners, uh, elected officials, all kinds of people that are involved in the shape of our community. Uh, today's not going to be any different. Uh, we have John from DSI Designing Constructions with us, and uh, we're going to take a, a close look at the work they do, how it defines our community, but also how COVID is affecting the work that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, before we get started, though, if this is your first episode, we want you to know a few things. First of all, uh, in addition to our annual sponsors, sponsors like DSI, uh, that help us survive as a 501c3 all year long. This series was brought to you specifically by a group of very generous people who sponsored week by week. This week's broadcasts have been brought to you by the Athens Area Chamber of Commerce. And so we wanna make sure you know how thankful we are to the Athens Area Chamber of Commerce for making this discussion possible. The other thing we want you to know is that this is not just something for you to watch. This is also something that you can participate in. It's interactive. Uh, so that provides you with the opportunity to go ahead and uh, submit a question below. So if you have a word of encouragement for John and his team, uh, if you have a piece of feedback, if you have a question, anything that you'd like to go on air with, just comment right below this video. As long as we're live, we'll be able to bring it on screen and make you part of this historic record. And that's right. This is a historic record. At the conclusion of all 55 interviews on June 26, when this thing ends, uh, we are going to uh, wrap this all together, tie it with a bow, and submit it as a digital archive to our local libraries and research institutions so that future generations can look back and understand how John, how his firm, how our whole community um, dealt with this moment in time. So uh, by commenting below, you'll be part of that discussion. So a little later in the program, we'll let you know what Historic Athens is. I know you see that logo on the screen. Uh, but for now, the most important thing is we introduce you to John. So we're going to go ahead and bring him on screen, and then we will have this discussion. So one moment here. All right. All right, John, thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? Good. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good. Uh, you know, John, one of the things that we are documenting here is uh, the technical end of everyone having to be in rooms and communicate with each other with tiny boxes mm -hmm. um, and some of that technical issues. So one technical issue that just happened is it went entirely dark outside. So I'm going to flip on the light. Give me one second. Um, that, that seems it's, a bit better. It's funny, uh, when you, so, were just, uh, you were just talking earlier, the bottom just dropped out here and I went and turned on my lights. Did the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, you know, it, it's a very real thing. I, I, you know, we had a conversation with Chief Sproul, Chief of the Athens Clark County Police Department, mm -hmm. uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, I can tell that Chief Sproul moves around a lot because the motion settings in his office were very sensitive, and so every few minutes uh, he'd have to go like this, or else. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, John, we're so glad that you're here with us. Uh, DSI, uh, I think that. The logo of DSI is something that even before I came to this organization, I knew just because uh, I, I had driven by it, I had run by it on millage so many times. I think that people have seen it associated with good work in Athens. Uh, but there may be some people that don't know you personally, um, or maybe they don't pay a lot of attention to design and construction, and so they don't know your firm. Uh, so could you take a few minutes and just introduce yourself to our audience? Sure, sure. Uh well, I'm John DeMint. Uh, I'm the owner and president of DSI Design and Construction. Um, a little bit about my history. I, um, you would never, I mean, looking at my history, you would never think that I would end up in Athens, Georgia. It's kind of funny, but, uh, but I'll try to sum it up. Um, I uh, grew up in Columbus, Georgia, so I'm in, in Georgia, in Columbus, Georgia, just south of Atlanta. And uh, when I grew up, my both my parents were Auburn grads, so you know, I was destined to go to Auburn, Alabama, go to school and get into construction uh, management, which my dad was in construction, our whole family, you know, pretty much is. So that was what I was going to do. 
Um, and when I came to graduating high school and making the selections of colleges, uh, at the time, my parents were getting a divorce after 25 years. And, as you can imagine, it wasn't a very pleasant uh, uh, experience, especially back then. And um, um, it was, okay, do I have a decision? Do I go 45 minutes away from this craziness and this, uh, you know, this divorce uh, and go to Auburn? Or do I get a little further away from, uh, from that? So uh, Clemson uh, University in South Carolina offered, uh, you know, uh, a place for me to go there and study where I wanted to go study. So I uh, elected to go there. So graduated from Clemson University some time ago. Um, and um, after graduating there, I went to work for some large corporations, large building construction companies, uh, international type companies, traveled all over the United States, um, Orlando, Washington, D.C., you know, in the middle of Atlanta. Uh, got to experience a lot of different things, a lot of different communities. Uh, just, you know, I never would trade that experience for the world. Um, but there was a time in my life uh, where traveling and going to different places seemed to start getting a little old. Um, and I was looking for a place to, to settle down and call home. This is where I wanted to be. I know that when I left Columbus, Georgia, that I knew just something part of me, I was never going to return there or never going to live there anyways. Uh, and uh, so visited Athens, um, like many people who come to Athens, fell in love with it. Um, and, you know, this is from somebody who lived in the middle of the, in Buckhead of Atlanta, lived in Washington, D.C., got to experience a lot of things, you know, during my uh, uh, experience working for different companies and, uh, uh, just came back and I said, wow, this has pretty much everything that I'm looking for, but less traffic and uh, just a lot of energy. Um, uh, you know, I did not graduate from Georgia. I have, uh, uh, I'm a Clemson Tiger, but I love the football, the energy that's here during football season. Uh, it's pretty addicting and uh, just the other aspects of Athens that it has to offer. So. Anyways, after a little bit, decided to form DSI Design and Construction. Um, I, you know, again, my passion is construction, and uh, just felt like, man, this is the thing to do. So back in 2004, uh, me and one other person uh, started DSI, um, and, uh, and just kind of blossomed and grew from there. Now, John, as we were talking about before we got on air. Uh, I was admiring over your shoulder that stormtrooper, um, <laughs> and uh, but but I'll say that as uh, you know, a lot of the people I know that are in design uh, have really creative and fun kind of philosophies on things. Uh, they take inspiration from a lot of different things. Uh, you know, what I'd love to hear about is what makes DSI unique. You know, I mean, what what uh, you do a lot of really technical work. You do a lot of very careful, sophisticated work. But then clearly, as I can tell from the office behind you, that you're not afraid to have some fun, too. So tell us a little <laughs> bit about what makes DSI DSI. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, well, uh, we do like to have a lot of fun. Um, it's, it's part of our uh, it's part of our makeup. I, you know, just going back to my experience a little bit, you know, working for the large corporations, um, I learned a tr I got a lot of tools, a lot of experience, a lot of value from them. You know, this is how to run a project. These are the controls. These are the procedures and the processes that you put in place. Uh, but what was what I really wasn't happy with was that everything seemed to be policy driven at the time. Um, so you come to work and there's a procedure, there's a policy that you have to follow, you know, to uh, to do certain things. And uh, in my mind, especially in, in construction, um, uh, is having that flexibility to adapt to whatever your client wants, whatever it needs. I don't have to write a letter uh, and, and, you know, uh, and, and practice risk management, document everything. It's just a person for me doing construction, and especially when you're talking about the amount of money that somebody personally is investing, uh, whether you're, you know, your individual money or rep whether you're representing uh, a commercial or a government entity. You know, those, that's money that you value. And for me, just, you know, having somebody that's personable and flexible, 
and be able to adapt to whatever your needs are and understanding that your needs may change and may offer during the, during the process of construction. You know, it's not such a big deal. Uh, we can, you know, we can accommodate that uh, and uh, try to communicate with you. So, uh, you know, for us, it's bringing a big company value, big company procedures in, in a small company environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's responsive, that's flexible, and just adapt to whatever our clients' needs are. John, you know, if, if I was talking to someone right now that ran a bakery, I'd ask them, how does a bakery work? You know, if I was talking to someone who was a bus driver, I'd ask, you know, how does driving a bus in Athens, Georgia work? I'm, I'm really interested in, just for our viewers, I imagine we have some tuning in that have no experience with construction, that um, have never gotten into that world, I appreciate what you were saying about how sometimes it could feel a little claustrophobic where it's just about the policies, but can you just give us construction, design and construction 101? How does a firm like yours work on a week to week basis? <laughs> it's uh, one of the things I like about construction. And, and let me just clarify when it says DSI design and construction, we necessarily, we do not have in-house architects or designers. Uh, we just uh, are mainly our main focus is construction, general contracting, construction right. management. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, we do collaborate with a pool of talented designers, architects, a lot here at Athens, uh, a lot of, you know, from different areas uh, that we've been able to team up with. So just want to clarify the design aspect, but, you know, and I'll focus mainly on the construction aspect. Um, you know, the, the, the one thing I love about construction is it's not routine. Every day is different. Um, and it depends on where you are with a construction project. Uh, there's a lot of challenges every day, whether it be material shortages, uh, material price increases, labor shortages, uh, uh, you know, COVID-19 um, issues, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, but there's always challenges that always happens, but it's it's always a good feeling of satisfaction when you overcome those challenges and get the work done. And for me, uh, so it's hard to explain a day-to-day -day operation. I mean, of course we come into work, we check our emails. Um, we have, at some days we have estimates to do. We put together estimates. Uh, some days we're running projects and it just depends on which phase uh, of construction that particular project is in. You know, it depends on what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So I guess uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's hard to determine, uh, hard to tell somebody exactly what we do every day, but uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a blast. Um, a lot of different experience. Oh, and so, so many people um, different from different walks of life. You know, you're talking about our clients and owners who are at the University of Georgia uh, Georgia College, you know, people, you know, in the academic world that have this education. And then you're talking to the the guy who's a carpenter out in the field or a guy pouring concrete. You know, I mean, these are folks that all deserve the same level of respect. Right. They have a certain value that they offer the community and to, into, you know, production and contributing to the community. And it's just a, a real joy and a real pleasure just to interact with all of them and just to experience just different types of uh, people and you know backgrounds and where they come from. In the same, you know, the same way with a construction project, you know, one day we'll be building a deck, one day we'll be doing a multi-million dollar restoration job on a on campus. Uh, you know, every job has its challenges. Every job has its you know, it, it's different, unique aspects to it. But, you know, I, I can't find a job that I don't know of a job that I've ever done. that I can look back and say, wow, man, that was really rewarding in some form or fashion, whether it be the product that you produce, the relationships that you made. Um, you know, so there's a lot of aspects of it. That's uh, truly so uh, it's a long answer to your question, but no, but it's uh, great. But the data, but, but it's hard to determine the day to day operation because of those so many so many aspects of it. Yeah, well, the idea that the variety is what keeps you going, that certainly makes sense. Um, I do wanna note that, you know, I see uh, we have folks tuning in and we're really glad that you're here. Um, I saw uh, Kat Walker was uh, helping encourage some people to come to the chat. I see Blake Smith just chimed in to say that he was 
uh, enjoying the conversation. Well, I'm glad to be here. Um, uh, if any of you that are watching have questions for John um, about uh, construction or about the work he does uh, or about how COVID's affecting his work, uh, feel free to chime in below and we'll definitely include that in this episode. Uh, John, as we start to tilt towards COVID-19 specifically, you know, one, one thing that was really a shame uh, as, as everything shuttered and shelter in place became necessary is we were preparing to uh, bring folks into your office. We were planning a pop-up preservation event where we were gonna encourage uh, you know, some of our members uh, and the public to, to really get in there and take a look at the work you've done in your own space. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we really like is when folks lead by example, and that's definitely something that DSI did with the way that you set up your office. You're not just someone out there doing historic construction. Uh, I know that's not all you do, but when you do it, you do it well. But you're not just doing historic construction. You made certain choices about the environment that you were gonna report to, and that was gonna inspire you to do work every day. Can you tell the tell us a little bit about your office um, and maybe what people might be able to expect to see when we reopen and, and reschedule that event? Sure. Um, well, uh... It's kind of a funny story how I eventually ended up, you know, renovating their office the way I did. But uh, but but it was the early 1900s construction, um, and uh, when I first moved into the office, I thought, hey, great, a house on millage, good space, good good investment. And I really, at the time, I really wasn't thinking about the historic restoration part of it when I first decided to come, you know, move my office here. Um, I just love the location. It was really good. And uh, as we moved in and, you know, we started growing a little bit and starting to establish a presence here, um, I wanted to, you know, do some upgrades and some renovation. And uh, and I, I was, was going to do something really minor to the outside just to improve its presence. And uh, in the middle of that process uh, of approvals, uh, uh, somebody came to me at the, from the university that we work with a lot. He came to me and goes, you know, John, you, you, you kind of, you're a historic restoration or historic renovation contractor. <laughs> it's kind of a funny story because it ended up costing me a lot of money. <laughs> goes, you know, you're a historic uh, uh, renovation contractor. He goes, what do you think about it? You know, you've got this presence on millage and uh, he goes, you ought to uh, really bring that patio back out front and i'm like man you really cost me a lot of money you know <laughs> so but once we got started the passion hit us and uh and man we uncovered just like we were at work but it's with my own building so it was like mm -hmm. you know twice as good um so we started uncovering little jewels and uh and just going through the whole process of restoring a lot of the features you know in it so I don't, it, I don't, you should see the photos of the way it looked before we started renovating or before we moved in. Uh, it looked awful. Oh, awful. And, uh, but now it's, it's a space we're really proud of. Uh, a lot of the features are unique, uh, and not unique, but historic uh, and unique to the building. Um, and uh, I just love it. We did it in a very uh, tasteful uh, way. I see a lot of people doing historic renovations and renovating their building cutting corners um, and for us we, we did it in a way that actually brought back a lot of the historic elements um, you know at the same time we've got a lot of uh, you know modern looking furniture and so we're just bringing a, you know historic uh, a foundation or a skeleton and just introducing new uh, elements into it so it just really makes for a really cool space that uh, we really enjoy working on yeah, well, I've had the pleasure of visiting it. It's a, it's a very unique space. And so we do look forward to helping introduce more people to the work you've done there. Uh, yeah. You know, um, John, I can't help myself. Uh, I know that uh, asking you some of your favorite projects might be like asking someone to choose their favorite children. Uh, but are there any projects in particular that you've done around the Athens area that you're really proud of? Uh, yeah, there, there are a couple of them. Um, and it, one of the, I'll, I'll talk about one of the projects really springboarded us, you know, have a historic contractor presence. Um, you know, 
you know, like I was saying earlier, I work for large construction companies and the big, you know, the projects that I worked on was, you know, resorts down in Orlando to high rises in downtown Atlanta um, to, you know, these big mega projects, which, you know, historic kind of, you know, wasn't part of it, but there was always a, you know, a, a personal side of me that, um, love the historic element of it. For some reason, I, I would struggle in math. I would struggle in everything. But for some reason, history, I always did really good. I didn't know because I was really passionate about it or really kind of interested in it. So it was always just a part of me, um, you know, to uh, just, a, you know, preserving a historical part of uh, culture or the community was just, you know, was just part of me or just learning from it, you know, also. And, um, when we started working at the University of Georgia, doing you know, lab renovations, auditoriums, and then I just, this opportunity fell in my lap to start a renovation at Memorial Hall, which is right next to the stadium. Um, and uh, in, the, in the group that I was working with uh, was really, you know, they really did the effort to, and, and uh, all the time spent to look back at what Memorial Hall looked like before we started renovating. And it was just a really cool process just to start seeing these historic elements elements come back to life. And at the same time, which, uh, you know, introducing new space like office space and be able to see how you can take, you know, a new use for something uh, you know, or take, you know, historic building and adapt it to a new use. And in the Memorial Hall renovation, uh, when it first started for us, was just it was, you know the same thing I was talking about with our office is just uncovering jewels. Uh, you know, there's a pool down there that was covered up, so we would get around and dig underneath Memorial Hall trying to find the pool, which we did, uh, and just finding just some cool features. Oh, just you know, just the joy it would be to find old photos of Memorial Hall and looking at it back then and looking at it yeah. now is really cool. So. Memorial Hall uh, would stand out. It was a, you know, it's a springboard, you know, into our historic uh, career in Athens, and just having that, you know, part of your resume certainly does help. So yeah, we've we've been working in Memorial Hall for years. It just goes in phases. You know, we would renovate some space here, renovate another space here. It's just a, it's an awesome building to 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 be in. And uh, over at the Health Science Campus, there's. Carnegie Library, uh, which was another re uh, renovation project that we did, uh, which was you know another early 1900s type library uh, structure um, that was really cool just to explore that and get to learn that and turn yeah. into. Well, yeah, John, I want to say that you know so the uh, and the health science campus is for those of you that have been around Athens long enough. The old Navy School campus contained an uh, old Carnegie Library, and seeing the photos of that one, that's really. Phenomenal Memorial Hall, John. I think the first one of the first times you and I talked, I mentioned, you know, you helped restore a space that has had so many functions in this community over such a long period of time. Um, I cut my teeth in Athens as a uh, hip hop artist and concert promoter when I was much younger, and there was a time where Memorial Hall was one of only two venues in Athens that would allow hip hop performances and uh, also home to the used to, for a very long time was home to the UGA radio station and yeah. things like that. So th that's great that you got to leave your mark on that space. Um, I'm seeing a burst of energy in the comment section. So I, I, I have to honor it by bringing it on screen here to say that. Um, so I see uh, Cheryl here. Uh, tell us about the duck picture in the, uh, in the back wall. Uh, Pat, Walker, <laughs> Pat Walker is also chimed in to say, Paul and Cheryl say hello. I want to know about the duck painting on the wall. Um, so I feel like we have to ask, what, what's the, the story on the duck painting in the wall? <laughs> well, I was going to save that for later when we talked about when we started talking about COVID-19, but I guess it's a good yeah, thing. Yeah, let's do it. Well, let's, let's bring it. Let's bring it in. It. So I don't know if you're, uh, if you, the audience, are familiar with an artist, uh, Bedard, B-E-D-A-R-D. Uh, but they, he's famous for doing these duck photos. There's like a ship of fools, uh, where it's a duck and a bunch of boats in, there, in the ocean. But this is a, a sitting duck. Um, this is the name of the painting called Sitting Duck. And, uh, and that pretty much describes how I feel right now. <laughs> <laughs> a sitting duck. And, uh, 
So uh, it's a painting that's been on my wall. It just represents a lot of, uh, uh, you know, especially if you're a business owner or a small business owner and, you know, you're, you're looking at uh, things and going all around you. And sometimes you just feel like a sitting duck and you're just waiting to see what happens. And, uh, you know, you're a big target out there. You probably can't see it, but there's two bullet holes next to his head, you know, and he's sipping on a cocktail. So uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good painting. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you're gonna be a sitting duck, you might as well be sitting with a cocktail. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, no doubt. So a couple quick comments and then um, uh, we'll tilt to the next thing here. So uh, I see Celeste from DSI. I'm assuming it's Celeste uh, posting, uh, learning about the history of Memorial Hall and all of the cool things John uncovered was one of my highlights working for DSI. Uh, so that's really great. Thanks for sharing. And uh, that's by the way, if you are looking at the comment section, you click through that DSI and construction account that just uh, commented, you can actually follow and like John's page. And then Jody Gration, who operates our Hands on Athens initiative um, and is also a trained preservationist, says Carnegie libraries are the best. And yeah. John, I'll say that until I had seen the photos of that uh, restoration, you know, in, in many ways it was interesting because the Navy school campus used to feel a little like the Vatican in Athens. I mean, I think the only time I'd ever been on the campus <laughs> was uh as a boy scout as a young person they had had an advanced arama there or something obviously the gates are no longer there you can explore more but i didn't even know we had a, a library like that in athens so that must have been a very exciting project to work on yeah um, so all right so i uh i want to make sure that we uh go back to this sitting duck thing so let's go back to the sitting duck thing okay so um so john uh What's it feel like right now? Uh, uh, you know, you're someone who you said you like the variety of life. You like getting out and doing all these different things. You like the idea that every day in the office might be different. Uh, but here you are sitting ducks. So uh, what's life like for John of DSI during uh, COVID-19? Wow. Well, uh, it's different, but in some regards, it's the same uh or some, I wouldn't say the same, but some things that, uh, you know, it's it's just another challenge and another obstacle is just pretty, you know, pretty extreme. But um, um, it's, it's a lot different. It's, it's when I talk to you about the interaction on the jobs uh, and not being able to have that. I mean, like the, the interview that we're doing now, uh, our meetings are on Zoom, which seems kind of odd and uh, matter of fact you know, month, you know, several weeks ago, a little over a month ago when this first started happening, um, we did an interview for a project on Zoom, which I was like, I mean, that's just kind of bizarre um, right. you know, to do this. So, you know, as far as those things go, those things go that's a little different um, or it's a lot different. Um, I, I think what makes me the most nervous is what the future holds for all right. this and what that means to my business for me personally or for everybody right. I guess and for that matter but and you know, when i talk about the immediate future i mean uh, as you know i mentioned memorial hall and carnegie library and i talked about the university of georgia and georgia college I and mean, we do a lot of work for the state um so a lot of our projects or a lot of our opportunities um are you know, tied to, you know, how the state's doing, how they're spending money. Uh, are they doing on infrastructure? Are they doing on improvements and renovations and stuff? And as everybody knows that, uh, you know, they are in a lockdown uh, right. and budget cuts. Uh, and, you know, the first thing to go are, you know, construction projects and upgrades that eh, we don't necessarily may need to do that renovation right now. Let's wait till, you know, a couple of years from now. Um, and uh, so, you know, I'll go into a little little bit more about explaining that, but, you know, in a sense, it's just an uneasy unrest about all the uncertainty that's, you know, going to happen as far as our opportunities go. I um, mean, fortunate for us, uh, we, we did uh, take advantage of a couple of opportunities, I mean, like weeks before the lockdown or the, you know, the, the quarantine or stay at home orders came out rather. And, uh, and we were fortunate to, to have take, take advantage of opportunities and have those in our contract. 
Mm -hmm. um, but those are only going to last for so long. And so it's going to, you know, what's going to happen after that, like the first quarter of, you know, 2021. Right. Um, and uh, so there's uh, the, the uncertainty. It's, it's very uneasy. Um, so our opportunities are limited. Uh, I will say that, you know, we, you know, several weeks ago, DSI did let go of, or, you know, we did make a decision to let go of a lot of people. Uh, I, I, I tell people 40% of the company, but, you know, four out of the 10, you know, just 40%, but it's still four individuals that, you know, they came in one day and their lives are, you know, totally changed uh, from the norm. So as a business owner, um, making those decisions, I, I can tell you, uh, is one of the most difficult, challenging decisions that you have to make. So, um, uh, there's just a lot of uh, anxiety um, and a lot of uncertainty, you know, ahead. And I could, I best, I mean, I think that would best describe the emotions or the feelings of, is that. Are we capable of company? Yes. I mean, are we able to do anything we want to do construction-wise? You know, is there anything here that, you know, we can't do? We can do anything and uh, if we just had the opportunities. And I'm just concerned that the opportunities Part, uh, you know, they're going to be very limited. We had two projects, two nice projects that went on nice, just but directly related to COVID-19. And if those two projects didn't, those four people wouldn't be laid off. You know, it's as simple as that. So, I mean, for us, it's, it's a direct impact, but there's also, it directly impacts us immediately, but there's the anxiety of a long-term impact also. John, what's it like for you? Let's delve into that a little bit. I know it's uncomfortable, but you know, as a leader, that 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 that's a lot of weight, and you're not alone in that. Every every leader we've talked to on this this uh, live cast has had to make difficult decisions about their organization. How are you dealing with that stress? I mean, are you finding new ways, new new habits, new hobbies, new uh, you know, you're out there running like the rest of Athens. I mean, what are you doing to manage the weight uh, of those kind of decisions? Well, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, you know, I do find myself a lot of time at the house. Uh, I am trying, I took up yoga and, uh, am, you know, trying to do yoga and, and believe me, I'm, I'm brothers like me ending up in Athens, Georgia. I was the furthest person from yoga too. Uh, but uh, learn to adapt it and learn to like it. So I do some of that, uh, just try to take care of myself, stay healthy, you know, keep the, you know, you, you, you really need to keep your mind right um, and stay focused because every moment matters. Uh, keep your mind clear, um, you know, uh, don't get bogged down. I, I'm going to tell you one of the main things is don't watch the news all the time. Right. Um, you, you need to keep your head clear, make decisions, what you feel is good for you, what's for your business and for your employees, and um, and uh, try to minimize the, the outside stresses coming into your life. Yeah. Uh, we have about a third of the program left here with uh, John, so please don't go anywhere. I'm just going to very briefly uh, take a moment to to uh, thank our sponsors here. This will only take a quick moment. And Blake, I do see your question. Uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, but very briefly, I just want to uh, bring up the following. Uh, so uh, what you see on screen here is the list of our annual sponsors. As we mentioned, today's uh, live cast is part of this week's live cast brought to you by the Athens Area Chamber of Commerce. But the names and logos you see on screen, which yes, does include John's firm, uh, DSI Design and Construction. Uh, you, you see that they are sponsoring us. That keeps our lights on and our team employed year round. Uh, it's important every year in our 52 year history, but I, I imagine there have been few years where we have been as grateful as we are for the sponsors you see on screen here. Uh, so please support them the way they're supporting us. You know, we work every day to celebrate and conserve Athens, Georgia, and that work is only made possible at all uh, by the names you see here. If you'd like to consider becoming a sponsor, uh, you can visit historicathens.com. Also, I mentioned that we're excited to take some of our members and offer a pop-up preservation event at John's offices. 
uh, when things reopen. If you're interested in becoming a member, we rely on those members very much. Uh, and membership starts as uh, little as $5 a month. You can also do that at historicathens.com. Uh, so we definitely encourage you to visit that uh, site and to uh, to check it out. And thank you to everyone you see on the screen. Uh, the list you see on screen right now, these are the 55 people we're speaking to as part of this live cast. Uh, John's is today. Tomorrow's David Lynn from the Athens Downtown Development Authority. Reverend Hart from First AME. Uh, then Jeff Bishop from First American. And then Keith Kepner from Kepner Boxing. That'll make up this week all sponsored by Athens Area Chamber of Commerce. So uh, we definitely are thrilled to have John on the program, uh, but then also feel free to tune in. If you missed an episode and you want to go back, you see a name that you're interested in hearing from, just like uh, today's interview, all of these videos will be available uh, once the interview is completed at our Facebook page. Uh, just go to our Facebook page and click on videos uh, for that past archive. And then um, one last note before we get back into John's interview here. Uh, we just want you to see this. Uh, part of our operation at Historic Athens is operating the Athens Welcome Center. Uh, the staff at the Athens Welcome Center uh, is bringing to you a new live cast that started last week at 2 p.m. Uh, every weekday. So right as soon as this uh, broadcast ends, if you want more pro programming related to all things historic, uh, you can visit the Athens Welcome Center Facebook page uh, today, they will be doing a live cast interview um, from the Carl Vincent Institute of Government, formerly the Lucy Cobb Institute. Uh, judging by the weather outside, that'll be interesting. I wonder if we'll see Michelle in a rain slicker or something. But uh, we do uh, we do encourage you to tune in at 2 o'clock uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday for virtual tours of historic sites throughout Athens and Tuesdays and Thursdays for a virtual workshop with Cape Short at the Athens Welcome Center itself. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, John, John, thanks for letting us uh, touch on all of those things, including our gratitude for your firm uh, for uh, sustaining us. Thank you. Um, uh, John, I want to go back to COVID, but Blake has a really good question here, and I want to make sure I, we don't get too far past it. Uh, so Blake Smith commented below the video to say, uh, when you work on existing sites with rich history, how do you balance modern design while respecting historical designs. Now, I know you mentioned that you work with architects, that you're coming at this from a construction standpoint, but these are still right. choices you have to make every day. Um, will you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, for me, when you look at it, like take our office, let me just use our office for example, is uh, when you look at historical elements of, of this office or just the detail, whether it be the crown molding or just the trim on it uh, or the flooring, um, you know, you that's really the main thing you want to preserve. But then you've got to get into the office and then you have to bring it up to code, whether it be ADA compliance uh, or, or building codes. And so it's not like you really, you know, you, you have to bring it up to it. You have to bring it up or do some type of uh, renovation to it to change that historic element of it, just to make it useful and per, you know, for its purpose. So when you do those things, it's actually you bring it in in a tasteful way. I don't know, sometimes you know, maybe an example that people can relate to is like when you look at a color, you know, you, you paint a color to a wall and you're like, well, I'm going to try to match it as best as possible or is it best just to try to go with something totally different that blends in real well to it. So it's kind of like that aspect to it. So to bring it into modern plus, you know, modern, uh, you know, desk, furniture, you know, have, uh, you know, obviously are more comfortable, more ergonomic. So there's you know new things that you have to bring in. And in my mind, when you try to make new stuff like that, try to make it look historical, sometimes it gets kind of like, well, it's not really historical. So why don't you just embrace the history of what's there and embrace what's modern and what's useful and just try to bring those together in the most tasteful way? You know, again, like you said, architects and designers, they they do this all the time and they get paid lots of money to do it. And there's very, you know, a lot of people are talented out there that do it. Um, it's just those are a lot of things that we've seen is when you just you take modern architecture 
and you, you know, embrace the elements of that, you take history, and embrace the elements of that, and try to bring it together in a case of one. Absolutely. So, uh, John, just getting back to uh, COVID for a second, thank you for that answer to Blake's question. And again, if anyone else watching has additional questions or comments, uh, feel free to comment below. Uh, you know, John, I don't want to concentrate so much on things that are making you feel anxious, but certainly that's what we're trying to document here. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned the word uncertainty, and I think that for so many organizations, if there's a word that is hovering over everyone's head right now, it's uncertainty. You know, it's uh, how is this going to affect uh, the people I make decisions with? How is this going to affect the landscape I operate in? And so what I'd like to just capture for the record is how you've been recalibrating. Because, uh, you know, you you came here from Columbus, Georgia. You, you settled in. You have uh, this great business that you've designed for a specific marketplace, for a specific environment. And all of a sudden, it's like someone hit this switch and we're in bizarro land. You know, what, what are some of the steps you've taken to innovate? What are some of the steps you've taken to recalibrate so that you can be prepared for the lean times ahead, but also just to be prepared to do business on a day-to-day -day basis? What are some of those steps that you've been taking? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, Tommy, um, I, like I said, I started DSI in 2004, and we started out really small, and we quickly grew from two, like I said, two people up to 15 people, you know, which, you know small. Uh, but for a construction management company, that's a pretty good size. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then the 2008-2009 recession hit. So when that hit, I mean, it nailed us big time, just like every construction company, a lot of different people, but it nailed us hard. And, you know, during that period of time, we went from 15 back down to two people. Uh, it was me and one other wow. person. And we we would come into the office. I mean, we wouldn't have anything to do. I mean, the phone wouldn't ring. I wow. mean, there was nothing going on. So, um, so the anxiety level during that time was a lot more and just the uncertainty was was you know a lot more but what it did it taught me to how to operate lean you know how to cut expenses and and making the tough choices uh you know like i mentioned before about letting four people go um you know we right when this first happens because i've been through that experience i mean when in 2008 2009 you know i went through all my savings you know try to keep things going um and just in in trying to live that same routine in that same office environment you know having the nice features and nice everything um you just gotta let go of those things really quick i mean you can just look at your budget uh look at where you see the opportunities go i mean there's there's one thing, you know, right when I talk about the sitting duck in the background, one thing I do have, the, really the only one thing I have control over is expenses. Mm -hmm. I don't have control over the opportunity anymore. I don't have control over, I mean, I only I, get, I have control of taking advantage of the opportunity, but as far as producing, you know, putting it in front of me, I don't have that much control over. But one thing I have a direct control over is expenses. So it's just a real hard look at those things and saying, hey, I don't need this anymore. Do I really need this? Um, and get rid of it um, and making those tough, tough choices. And uh, so 2008, living through that recession and coming out of it as a company, you know, for ourselves taught us a whole lot. Um, the environment we work in and construction where everything's just fluctuates you know whether you land two jobs you land five jobs you don't land any jobs it's kind of a, a natural you know ebb and flow uh anyways but uh, um so we're, you know mentally uh we we're prepared for it i think a little bit more than some companies are um and uh, the technology and construction everybody says the technology is you know behind but when it comes to the construction management part of it you know it's it's there um and so we don't need a whole lot to, to operate and to function, you know, and be productive as a construction company. So it's just making those tough decisions and choices uh, 
you know, you got to make the insurance, you know, do we need it? Do, can we afford health insurance or not? Right. You know, 401ks and retirements and, you know, all of those things are on the board uh, and need to be, you know, need to be considered, you know, as an expense. And, you know, just think about the livelihood, not only of yourself, but of your few employees that you have. Right. You know, John, when you mentioned that part about how you had wiped out your savings in the past, it's in, it's so fascinating to hear that just because, I mean, that says a lot about how you feel about your own organization because that's not something that everyone does. And so clearly this is something that has not only been part of your life since 2004, it's something that is deeply, deeply important to you. Um, you know, uh, if you have, if there's anyone else out there watching this right now who also has their own company who's feeling that stress, since you have gone through this before in 2008, I mean, do you have any advice for those business owners that are feeling that pressure right now? Uh, wow, I don't never really consider myself an expert <laughs> writing a book, but I, I guess Tommy, it, it would be don't be afraid to make the tough decisions because. It's not, you know, it's, you know, and it's not your fault. Right. Uh, you know, the things are happening is don't take it personal. Uh, that was one thing I used to do for a long time because, you know, the small business owner, you know, your business tends to be a reflection of you, your success and your failures. Yeah. Uh, and it's hard to let that go. And don't believe me, it's a struggle of mine and a battle of mine that I go back and forth with. I'm sure everybody does you know, a lot of people do the same boat, but, you know, don't be afraid to make the tough decisions and don't take it personal. Um, you know, this is not a reflection of your ability. You know, what's happening now is totally out of your control. Um, and just don't be afraid to make the tough decisions. Well, I'm sure that that sound advice that you may not be ready to write that book yet, John, but that was pretty sound advice that I'm sure hit home for a lot of people. I know, I, I just felt it wash over me as someone who has to run a nonprofit and uh, yeah. I, it landed for me too. So um, John, uh, our conversation has flown by. We have about 10 minutes together. Um, and what I'd like to do is touch on three questions we've been asking each of our guests. Uh, the first one is a bit light. Uh, it'll lighten things up a bit here. Um, okay. But uh, every one of our guests had fun answering this so far. So. Um, somehow, if you were to wake up tomorrow, quarantine was over, uh, all of our favorite Athens businesses were up and running again, uh, not just the great ones that are already doing curbside, uh, and you could go anywhere you wanted in Athens tomorrow. Um, how would you spend your day? What would be some of the places you'd stop by first? Oh, wow. Um, man, uh, well, I'd have to walk my dog at Ben Burton Park, which I think yes. opened today. Uh, I'd have to take my dog for a walk at Ben Burke Park. Uh, have to catch lunch at Fully Loaded Pizza um, and uh, Five Points, and then uh, probably catch Happy Hour at Blind Pig Tavern. And uh, and uh, oh man, dinner. This that's tough around here. Uh, I really love the National. Um, I would. Uh, I probably would end up there. Oh, that's tough. It's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I've, some of our guests have joked that they've gained the COVID-19 pounds through uh, just sitting around <laughs> eating. I can guarantee you I'm going to gain the COVID-19 pounds once things reopen because yeah. Every, yeah. every place that every one of our guests lists, including the ones you just listed, yeah, fully loaded would be great. I miss Blind Pig desperately, the Burnham Burger desperately, all those places yeah. are national uh, great examples. Um, our, our two last questions, uh, John, uh, you know, part of what historic Athens does is historic preservation. Uh, you know, we're gearing up in June for our historic preservation awards, our 51st. And, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you've been the past recipient of awards from us before, you know, one of the concerns in the preservation world is that after a recession, uh, sometimes, uh, Folks are so eager to build new things that can endanger past historic things. And so we're really just in our mind right now trying to think about what are our favorite historic sites. In other words, 
let's say someone's watching this video in a library 60, 70 years from now, what are the historic sites that we hope are still standing that we hope that when they leave that library, uh, they can get in their car or jetpack or <laughs> whatever, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and go to. So what are some of the historic sites in Athens that you love that you hope that that future viewer is still able to go visit? Mm. Well, I'm a little biased. I'm going to have to say sure. because of uh, yeah, that I've worked on them, but Memorial Hall would definitely be one. Yeah. Uh, Carnegie Library uh, would be another. And of course, 455 North Millet Avenue, which is our office. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you're, if you're viewing this, if you're you, the viewer, if you're viewing this 60 years from now, uh, make sure to visit those three. Also, if you're viewing it now in 2020 and you haven't had a chance to see those three, definitely find a way in the next year to set eyes on all three of those. They're really phenomenal, especially if you're already out exploring the city all the time and you need a new place to take a look at, a new uh, destination. Uh, uh, take a look at the outside of the DSI office, uh, the Carnegie Library and Memorial Hall, and then as soon as it's safe, we'll, we'll try to get you uh, out there to take a sneak peek. So. Um, uh, John, my last question to you, it's very open-ended, uh, is just uh, thinking again to that future generation, thinking to someone maybe 100 years from now watching this video, uh, uh, what would you want that person to know about Athens during this time, during COVID-19? Wow. Um, I really think it was, uh, uh, wow. Um, I'll tell you that, you know, Tommy, I, I, like I told you when we started this, I watched many of the interviews before I did this one. I was like, man, what am I getting myself into? And uh, so I watched many of the interviews and I thought to myself, wow, I didn't know anything about that person. And, uh, and it was just really interesting, not only to hear about the COVID-19, but also just the history of that particular person, that leader, like you're saying, business leader or government official, and just knowing where they come from and just knowing what their responses to this question were. But I just found it amazing about how, you know, of all the people you talk to, and I'm sure the other people, just how much they care about the community and uh, mm -hmm. this, you know, and, and, you know, where they work and where they live and how important Athens is to them. And I just think that that's pretty amazing how personable that everybody takes Athens, Georgia, sort of like me when I first moved here. I was like, man, I really love this place. I never felt that way when I lived in Atlanta or Orlando or Washington. See, you know, I just really enjoy being here. I love the people. I love the community. Um, you know, again, my my past mold doesn't. You never would have guessed I would have been here, but it's just great how everybody's coming together and supporting each other, uh, and uh, and just being able to see how much everybody's expressing that they want to help each other and in uh, that you know and doing that themselves. So just the, the, the fellowship and just coming together as a community is pretty remarkable. Thanks for saying that, John. And I'm sure a lot of folks are going to feel the same way watching your video. I'm, uh, you know, your world is not a world that everyone understands for sure. And and so I'm glad that we've had this chance to take a peek at it. Uh, for you. folks out there, you know, if somebody comes across this video who is interested in doing business with you or finding out more about the work you do, uh, can you tell us where we can find you online? Uh, yes, www.dsidesignconstruction.com. Okay, great. And that's also, uh, that's great. And for anyone who wants to take a closer look, who's already Facebook friendly, just go below this video. You'll see where DSI commented. You can click through to their Facebook page, follow and like them. Um, John, we want to thank you so much for being on the program. Uh, in a you. moment, you and I are going to uh, go offline here, um, and I'll have a chance to thank you right after the broadcast. But uh, to anyone else who's tuning in, we just want to let you know, uh, right after this at 2 o'clock, you can go to the Athens Welcome Center Facebook page for some additional live programming uh, with our interim director, Michelle Wynn. Uh, we also want to let you know that we will be back here at 1 o'clock tomorrow uh, for our next episode in this series. So we're really looking forward to having you back. So please tune back in at 1 o'clock every weekday until June 26th. And then I'm just, I just shared the DSI uh, website here. It's in your comment section, but it's also on your screen. So uh, thank you again to John for being on the program. Uh, thank you again to the Athens Area Chamber of Commerce for sponsoring this week's broadcasts of the livecast. John, we hope you're staying safe out there. 
uh, viewers, we hope you're staying safe out there. Uh, thank you so much and uh, have a great day. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Bye.